God of grace and mercy, as we labor this morning to prepare the soil of our souls for your harvest, remind us that there is no stone that you cannot help us remove. Remind us that when the weeds try to take over, you bend down alongside of us to help clear the soil. Your generosity, O oh God, knows no limit, and you walk along the path in solidarity with us, and we give thanks for that. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. So there is a direct correlation between the fact that my attempts at gardening over the years were half-hearted at best, and the fact that I had very little success at gardening over the years. Direct correlation between those two facts. Now, a couple of months ago, through my connection with a nonprofit organization in Flemington, I was able to get my hands on several flats of plants, tomatoes, peppers, various herbs, and so on. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to give gardening a try one more time. Even though it's much, it's much, much simpler for me to just rely on my past history and say, you know what, I have two black thumbs. But I'm trying, and so far so good, I haven't killed anything yet. I'm watering the plants faithfully, and um, like I said, so far so good. Now when I hear the parable of the sower, I find myself a little out of my element because of my past history with planting things. The sower in this parable gets results. And if we read this parable strictly from the standpoint of the sower, we can interpret it about the importance of getting results. Jesus says that if you plant seeds in the pathway, you're going to get bad results because people are going to trample the plants underfoot to take away. The moral of the story then is that we should not plant seeds in the pathway. If we plant soil, if we plant in soil that is shallow, the plants will grow but die as soon as the sun hits it because they don't have deep roots. The moral of the story is don't plant in shallow soil. But if we plant our seeds in good soil, just deep enough, and away from where everyone is walking, with no thorns, then we'll get good results. We'll accomplish our goals, and the church will grow. Amen? Amen. Great. So from that perspective, the parable seems to be telling us to be very, very careful about where we plant the seeds of fruit to ensure that the potential growth is greatest. Got it. Parables about getting good results. And that fits right into our narrative as a culture, doesn't it? We're all about getting good results. We're all about success. We're all about winning. We're all about achieving. The message that teaches us about putting seeds on the good, in the good soil and bearing fruit, in one case a yield of 100 to 1, in another a case of 60, another case 60 to 1, and in another case a yield of 30 to 1. That type of message, that plays right into our wheelhouse. Oh, everyone who has ears to hear should hear this one. This is how we get good results. And isn't that what the church is all about? But then the question that I have from all of this is exactly what are the results that Jesus was looking for from his disciples and then by extension us? This is the challenge we face when reading parables. We often come away from them with more questions than when we started. And what makes this parable unique from all of the others is that Jesus actually tells us. He explains to us this one. And he doesn't typically do that. Verses 19 through 23 explain everything. Jesus says that when anyone hears the word of God, their response is an indication of the type of soil they are. A person who has no root, who hears the word of the kingdom and then falls away, this is someone whose soil is rocky ground. The person who hears the word of God but cares more for the riches of the world, for the next shiny thing, their soul is, their soil rather, is full of thorns. And the person who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, this person's soil is good. Now there are two things I want you to notice about this. The first is that Jesus is not describing our role as the sower. He's not telling the disciples how they should be planting seeds of faith. He is describing for us the human condition. He is describing conditions that we have all been in at one point or another in our lives. We have all been the rocky soil at one point or another. 
We have all been full of thorns at one point or another. We have all experienced times when our faith has been trampled upon, and we have all experienced times when the soil of our faith has been rich and deep and full of nutrients and full of growth and bearing fruit. The second thing is that the sower in this parable does not scatter seeds discriminately. When it comes to planting seeds, this, this sower would have been wasting a lot of seeds because he's throwing them everywhere. Even I know that you don't just throw seeds everywhere and expect a good results. The people of the first century, first century Israel would certainly have known that as well. But this sower is just spreading seeds everywhere. And no matter where the seeds go, there is still some degree of growth, some degree, even if just for a little while. The sower in the story is not us. The sower in the story is God who is generous, who is loving, and whose desire for community and growth extend to everyone, no matter what condition the soil of their souls may be in at that moment. So what does it mean then for us to be that lush soil? If our soil is full of growth and Jesus is the gardener, what's our role in all of this? Are we devoid of responsibility here? But Jesus refers twice to those who hear should understand. Those of us who hear, those of us in whom the seed of God's word is planted and bearing fruit, we should understand. We need to understand. God's word is meant not just for those of us who are in the good soil category. God's word is meant for everyone. In the parable, we see God not as this cautious giver, but as an extravagant one. The seeds were scattered generously to every piece of ground that would have had even the slightest opportunity to grow and bear fruit. It didn't matter to the sower in this parable that there were rocks or weeds or birds ready to come and steal the seeds. The seeds were scattered. The word of God was spread to everyone, to everyone. In those times that we struggle to achieve growth, we have the opportunity in our lives to either let the seeds in our faith wither away or to do the work of cultivating the soil of our souls. And we need to constantly check the soil of our souls and cultivate until the, and cultivate it into a condition in which growth is possible. After all, if God ensured that God's word would only be spread to those whose soil is not contaminated in some way, shape, or form, how many of us would have received it? I know I wouldn't. It is only by God's grace, it is only by God's great generosity that I am able to stand here and proclaim that the seed of God's word has been planted in me. But at the same time, I assure you of this, in many ways I am like the footpath. Many times God's word has left my heart as soon as it is received snatched away. And I assure you that I am like the shallow soil with underlying rock. Many times I have heard God's word with great joy, but have just as quickly lost focus or passion when I get distracted by something else. Very often I am like the soil with thorns. The distractions of this world tend to lure me away from the message of God, and I'm worrying or focusing on something that is not of God. But in spite of all of that, God is an extravagant giver. God is a generous sower. The seeds of God's grace and message are scattered to all of us in spite of ourselves. And as the recipients of God's generous sowing, we cannot pretend that our soil is always so lush and fertile that we then look down upon those who may be stumbling and falling through the weeds of their life right now tripping over the rocks in their path. But if we embrace God's gratuitous giving in ourselves, then it is incumbent upon us all to recognize ourselves as lavish gifts from God, and in turn, in turn assure, ensure that the sower's work is not wasted. In my involvement in youth ministry over the years, I can remember times when it seemed as though we youth leaders were just spinning our wheels that the youth were just sitting there like lumps, and it could be very frustrating. 
But years later, when those same youth would come up to you in church and give you a great big hug and you realize that you did, in fact, make that connection, that through us, God planted a seed and it is actually yielding fruit. It's an amazingly rewarding feeling when you realize that you played a part in planting those seeds. You played a part, but with faith, we can also be rest assured that we may not always see the fruit, but we know that God is a generous sower. So is it enough for us to view this parable strictly from an individual perspective? Do we only take stock in ourselves and say, well, I know that my soil is good, or my soil is rocky, or my soil needs work here or there? Or do we, as a community, need to do the same? How does the church welcome those whose soil may not be as receptive as ours? And as we endeavor to be the church of Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world, we must remember that if the soil is our faith, then we can see growth in a multitude of ways. If the soil is our church, if the soil is our egos, if the soil is our fears, or if the soil is our worries, then we're going to be in trouble. Now, over the years that I've been in ministry, I've been engaged with many, many people from a great many walks of life, and they have shared with me how their respective church has turned them away in some way, shape, or form. The soil of their church tells them they're not welcome, rocky and thorny. Churches that profess that all are welcome can, in many ways, go out of their way to make people feel unwelcome. And today I'm calling upon the church for a time of checking our soil. How is our soil today? How is our soil now? I'm calling upon each of us within this congregation to join me in checking our soil, a period of examining ourselves in how those whose soil may be rocky and full of weeds are to be welcomed and affirmed in the church. Is it enough for us to say that all are welcome? Is it enough for us to just say that our doors and our hearts and minds are open? Or do we need to demonstrate that somehow through our actions, through how we live in our community, how do we live as good soil that bears fruit if we are unwilling to extend God's generosity outward beyond these four walls to those who are unable to produce fruit at this moment in their lives? Because God is a generous giver. How can our soil even be considered good fruit-bearing soil if we're not extending outward to help others bear fruit as well? If the church only focused on what is planted in ourselves individually, because if so, then the church is rocky soil indeed. Is the church merely focused on the soil that grows within us? Because if so, the light of the sun will surely cause our fruit to wither away. I call upon us today to check our soil. I call upon us to prayerfully examine how our own preconceptions about our place in the world and our place in our community and the condition of the soil in our souls. To believe that God's generosity is so extravagant that God will produce fruit given any limitations. I call upon the church, and I call upon the church today and for the rest of the calendar year that we devote ourselves to a reflective and contemplative and meditative prayer to, uh, to a period in determining and focusing on how we should be challenged to help cultivate the soil in others that the soil in our own souls may bear more fruit. We may be surprised at how many rocks and thorny branches we have to pull from our own soil. Now I started out this morning by saying that there is a direct correlation between the fact that my attempts at gardening over the years were half-hearted at best and the fact that I had very little success at gardening over the years. There's a direct correlation between how we cultivate the soil of our souls and how we become disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And I want to invite you and I want to challenge you to join me as we strive to be the church of the 21st century ready to ensure that the soil that is our souls is prepared to extend out into the world to ensure that no one is made to feel trampled upon by hatred, by discrimination. No one is made to feel choked with the weeds of selfish desires. No one is left to wither away by apathy. 
God is a generous and gracious sower of grace. So let us check our soil. And in so doing, let us celebrate God's generous giving extended outward to be the bearers of a yield so grand they'll never finish counting it. To God be the glory. May we nurture the seeds planted within us. May we go out celebrating the life God gives us. And may we carry the knowledge that life is precious and God is life-giving to a world that needs God's growth. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit nurture the soil within your souls that you may experience an abundant harvest. My friends, we go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another.